Hello everyone, I hope you all had a good Easter and today we're going to go back in time with Peter Brown and find out more about the Beatles through his experiences. And I'm going to leave things out that I've mentioned in other videos, but if there are things that take on a different perspective than what we've heard before, I'll mention it. So let's get into the story. Well, now first coming up is the Dolly Birds. Cynthia started to mention the Dolly Birds, they were groupies and their mission was to sexually snare a rock musician. Cynthia was leery of them. They followed the band everywhere. They could be at the changing room at the cavern or passing by one of the Beatles' homes. They flirted and brought the band members' presents. Cynthia knew what a threat they were because Dot Ron, who was Paul's girlfriend for a few years, had Paul break up with her. One night, while Dot and Cynthia were sitting around in their bathrobes and curlers, and smoking cigarettes and drinking tea, Paul showed up at the door, and he took Dot into the room to talk with her privately. She was in tears, and when they came out of the room, Paul took off, and he told her that there were so many girls available, he didn't want to be tied down to one girl. So Dot moved out and disappeared from the scene, and Cynthia was afraid the same thing was going to happen to her. The summer of 1962, Cynthia was living in a one-room flat. It was hot and stuffy, and John was away working most of the time, and her mother was in Canada. She had to go on public assistance, and that embarrassed her. By August, she was pregnant. She had never used birth control during her two-and-a-half-year sexual relationship with John. She went to her girlfriend's doctor, and he said she was pregnant. When she weepily told John, he was quiet for a moment, and then he said he would do what any northern man would do if he got his girl pregnant. He would marry her. Cynthia's mom was disappointed, but turned understanding when Cynthia told her John would marry her. Aunt Mimi said that John was too young, and she didn't approve of the wedding, and didn't go or give them her blessings. Well, the firing of Pete Best had everyone in an uproar. There were protests by loyal fans who slept on the doorstep of Pete's mother's house. Girls picketed the NEMS -N and the Cavern Club, and they had signs that said, Pete is best and Pete forever. Mona Best, Pete's mom, wasn't thrilled either. She thought he was fired because the other three were jealous of him. Ringo was 22 when he was asked to join the Beatles. Surprisingly, the Beatles knew Ringo well from their time in Hamburg, not in Liverpool. He was with the band Roy Storm and the Hurricanes, and they had been watching him with Roy, Roy Storm. He was fun-loving and uncomplicated and got along with everybody in the group. Rory and his band was losing their popularity, and George called Ringo and said he was wanted to fill the open drummer spot with the Beatles. He would be on salary for 25 pounds a week during a probationary period. If things worked out, he would be a full-fledged member of the band. George Martin was surprised when Ringo showed up with the Beatles at the recording session. George Martin hadn't heard that Pete had been fired, and Martin hired a session drummer named Andy White. So this wasn't good news for Ringo. Ringo was handed a tambourine to use on a recording, and later George Martin saw how Ringo looked miserable, so he allowed Ringo to record a few of the drum checks. But George Martin was a great team member. The Beatles were lucky to have the great chemistry with George. He transported their inarticulate ideas into music. None of the Beatles could read or write music, but Paul was later to teach himself. Brian ordered 10,000 records of Love Me Do for NEMS, he thought by doing that he could get a place on the British charts. Then he got a letter-writing campaign to Radio Luxembourg and the BBC. All the Beatles' relatives and friends were asked to write letters requesting the Beatles' new song. And Queenie herself walked all over London from store to store asking if they had Love Me Do by the Beatles. Brian started to organize and promote his own concerts, all of them headlining the Beatles. After hundreds of requests, Radio Luxembourg played it. The BBC followed with one or two replays, and that got the ball rolling, and Love Me Do appeared at 49 on the new record mirror charts. By mid-December, Love Me Do battled its way up to number 17 on the hit parade. Brian asked, could anything be more important than this? The next song was Please Please Me. John wrote the song years before. He was sitting on the pink eyelet of Aunt Mimi's bed. George Martin told the Beatles, gentlemen, you just recorded your first number one. Brian had the Beatles on the road opening for Helen Shapiro. By its fourth weekend, 
The song was number nine, and on March the 2nd, 1963, the Beatles had their first number one hit with Please Please Me. When Julian was born, it was a week before John could see him. Brian got Cynthia a private room, but John was sighted, and John said he wanted Brian to be the godfather to Julian. He said he was going to go with Brian on vacation when the tour was over. Cynthia was upset. Being selfish again, aren't you? He said, I've been working my bloody ass off on one night stands for months now. Those people staring through the other side of the glass are bloody everywhere haunting me. I deserve a vacation. And anyway, Brian wants me to go, and I owe it to the poor guy. Who else does he have to go away with? So Brian and John went to Barcelona at the end of April 1963. They saw bullfights. They spent days shopping and taking side trips. At night, they toured the nightclubs. Each night, they would sit on the candlelit cafes and watch the couples stroll by in the moonlight. Over bottles of wine, they talked about Brian's personal life. John said to Brian, If you had a choice, Epi, if you could press a button and be a hetero, would you do it? And Brian said, Strangely, no. So I don't know if that was true or not. And then they had a part in the book that said John was experiencing things like a writer would, and he would point out a man and ask Brian if he found him attractive or unattractive. And when they got back to the suite, they were both drunk and sleepy with the wine, and Brian and John undressed in silence. And John said, it's okay, Eppy, and lay down on his bed. Brian was afraid to hug him, and John lay there, tentative and still, and Brian fulfilled his fantasies, but the next day he felt hollow as before. Some news spread about John and Brian's vacation among the Beatles' families and close friends. Everyone was puzzled why John had gone, knowing Brian had been trying to get him alone for years. And Cynthia was the most confused, and she was a prisoner of Mendep's while John was gone most of the time working, and he would stay for a few nights overnight. And when he did go to Mendep's, he was with Julian for only a few minutes before he got disgusted with his crying, and if Cynthia had to change a diaper, he would go out the door. Mimi was thinking that Julian was hers as much as Cynthia's, so when Cynthia's mother returned, she ended up living with her. They found a place to live, which wasn't great. Cynthia hadn't thought to ask John for money, and he didn't offer any. So John and Cynthia went to Paul McCartney's 21st birthday at Aunt Jen's place. At the party was cavern disc jockey Bob Wooler. So John was drunk and started beating on him, and it took three men to get him off of him. And John broke three of his ribs, and he was sent to the hospital. Cynthia timidly went to John to see what was wrong, and he said, I broke his bloody ribs for him. So Cynthia asked what he did, and John said, he called me a bloody queer, and he said that Brian and I were queer. So Bob sued John for damages, and John didn't want all this negative publicity. He had Rex Macon settle it quietly out of court for 200 pounds. Paul at this time was having a blast. They said Paul was like a starving man at a feast regarding all the women available to him. The thing was, no matter how many girls he dated and slept with, there was something missing. They weren't nice girls, not the kind of girls he could take home to his mother Mary, if she were still alive. Peter Brown said that although every northern man likes whores, in the center of his predominantly Irish Catholic middle class heart, what he wants the most is a nice girl to settle down with and raise his children. It was then that Paul met Jane Asher on May the 9th, 1963, after returning home from vacation with George and Ringo, that they had gone to the Canary Islands. Jane was 17 and pure and beautiful. Paul met her at the Royal Albert Hall, and she was at the concert as a celebrity team reporter for the BBC radio program. And the radio program was called Radio Times, and the Beatles were asked to pose with her for a photograph. After the show, she joined the band at the Royal Court Hotel on Sloan Square for sandwiches and coffee. They all liked her, and George talked the most to her, but it was Paul she was most interested in. Paul fell in love with the whole idea of Jean as much as her personality itself. She was a virgin. She lived with her parents. She was a girl of breeding, and Paul was intimidated with her family at first and started to read for knowledge for the first time in his life. So Jane guided him with books and tickets to the ballet and theater. Eventually, Mrs. Asher asked him to move into the guest room of their home instead of renting hotel rooms all the time, and he stayed there for two years. And Ringo found love at this time, too. Ringo never felt he was attractive, and now women were throwing themselves at him. He had gone out with a woman named Geraldine and asked her to marry him when he was in 
Rory and the Hurricanes band. They broke the engagement and she gave the ring back to Ringo. And it was then he noticed the girl Maureen Cox went out with Rory's uh, guitarist Johnny Guitar. And he didn't speak with her because she was someone else's girl. But one day he noticed her standing in a crowd of girls in the front of the Cavern Club at lunchtime. And he drove up in a used blue and cream Ford Zodiac. And Ringo asked her if she was coming to the show the next night, and she said she was. She was 16 at this time, and he asked if she wanted to go out after the show, but she said it would be difficult because she had to be home at 10 minutes before midnight. So he arranged their date to be in the afternoon, and their first date went well. They were a perfect match for each other. He was simple and uneducated, and she was a sweet, giggly girl without much to say. Now we come to the Ed Sullivan Show. Brian met with Ed Sullivan's son-in-law, who produced the show. Bob, the son-in-law, wanted to sign them for a one appearance, but Brian wanted them to headline. Uh, they wanted to appear on Ed Sullivan's show because he was the best, and they were the best, too. And a deal was struck that Brian and Bob uh, had together. The Beatles would headline not one, but two shows. There was a Sunday on the 9th and the 16th in 1964 and they would receive in total $3,500. Even with Ed Sullivan paying the airfare, the $7,000 fee wouldn't cover expenses. So Brian signed them to headline, but had to float the trip to the tune of some $50,000. So I'm going to end the video here. There were a lot of things going on in this episode. The dollies after the Beatles. John and Brian's vacation was caused a lot of questions and trouble. And love found Ringo and Paul. And it ended with the Beatles showing up on the Ed Sullivan show. Even though they headlined, Brian lost the group a lot of money. But it may have been worth it because everyone remembers their appearances on the show and it seemed to shoot them to superstardom. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed the episode. And if you did, if you could give it a thumbs up, it would be greatly appreciated. And I wish everyone a good day and tune in again soon for another episode of The Beatles Forever. And, then, and we'll continue to see what Peter Brown reveals in his book. So have a good day. Bye.